This panel on interventions in language and activism brings together a wide range of work on contemporary and social, um, contemporary art and social practice that aligns with or responds to the loosely organized set of principles, practices, and politics we might call feminist. What I particularly appreciate about them, collectively and individually, is, that their, att is their attempt to locate contemporary feminism, uh, a daunting task in a moment when I, and perhaps I'm dating myself here, like those feminists of a certain generation, Liz Linden and Jennifer Kennedy re reference, um, I've come to wonder if feminism is, if not dead, then in danger of stalling out in some ways. Um, so I'm deeply gratified and inspired to hear a resolute no for, to that question in reading all of these papers. While these papers scan the contemporary art landscape and point to where feminism might be found in the body, in the work of particular artists, in the policies of art curators, um, continuities between art practitioners then and now, et cetera, um, they tend to refrain from positing what it, what it is, which is a wise and perhaps necessary choice, leaving us with what Liz and Jen term, quote, <clears throat> excuse me, something even better, many, many more questions. So I have a few cursory observations to make about each of the papers in this regard, uh, along with, how could I resist, a few questions of my own, which I offer as provocations for the discussion to follow. Um, and my, actually, my suggestion to the panelists is to take note of my questions, and if you're really burning to make a brief response immediately following them, we'll have that. But then I'd like to turn it over to the audience questions as quickly as possible, since we can always continue our discussion afterwards, whereas some folks in the audience may not have the luxury of that time. So first, Sasha Grayson's essay on Lucy Orta's expansive 70 by 7 project quite rightfully characterizes this work as feminist, the artist's demural on the label notwithstanding, but she also quite helpfully complicates what feminists might mean. For as Sasha reminds us, quote, the identity of those who need food to survive has no outside for the human community. And on the flip side, who is not implicated in the globalization of factory farming and world hunger? Still, her spectacular, larger than life, self-reflexive in my mind, a materialist critique of the invisibilization of the significance of that work. Um, I have a few questions, um, or just things that uh, were brought up for me by uh, reading the paper. Um, so I thought that the observation that direct political work seems to have gone out of favor, uh, really intriguing, and it led me to two questions, again, as an outsider to um, visual art studies. Um, and that is, to what extent is that sort of um, shying away from direct political work and ex um, a function of the art market? These are real questions for me, I, I just don't know. Um, and is it possible that this new art is not without, this new seemingly apolitical work is not without politics, but that it's encoding them in new ways or along new um, political alliances? Um, so that's my first question. <laughs> my second question is about the uh, Chiravanesia work. Um, because I think there's another what for that might be identified here, one that appropriately does take place within a gallery for that uh, elite everyone that Bishop um, is critiquing. Um, for what that event made legible for me when I read about it, I wasn't there, um, was the countless times I've been at similar events amongst a crowd of mostly white people served deliciously exotic food cooked and served by brown people, or again, the countless times ethnicity comes to be explained or reduced to cuisine, uh, explained by or reduced to cuisine. So might we be able to complicate this binary between male, female, elite, democratizing, insular, expansive, anti, or feminist by thinking about the critique made available by each piece within a broader and larger historical context? And my last question uh, for Sasha is, uh, perhaps this is unfair, but I wonder about the possibility, this is sort of the flip side of the last question, about the possibility of actual community being fostered over Orta's dinners. Um, community need not be harmonious, but presumably recognition of something shared, a belief, a goal, an implication. Um, 
Yet, as we all know, it's easy to avoid points of conflict when our bellies are full and our time together is fleeting. Uh, so I suppose the larger question is, why is community a productive objective? Or might there be other ways of envisioning relationality? Um, I guess this question comes to mind as a result of reading Professor Koh's cogent account of Project L and the problem of queer visibility in the Korean context. The artists of Project L may have lost a certain opportunity for engagement with the wider, femini wider public or maybe wider feminist public um, in getting booted from the festival, but um, especially given the medical self-help spin of the larger festival, I wonder if we might not see their expulsion as a sort of blessing in disguise, um, in that they were able to present their work in a way that actually critiqued the medicalization of non-normative sexualities and allowed for specifically queer feminisms that did not emerge, pardon the pun, from biological femaleness. Thus, by presenting their work alongside, but not incorporated into uh, the festival, and I realize they didn't actually coincide, but within a year or so, let's say, alongside. Um, presenting their work alongside, but not incorporated into the festival, uh, they challenged the monolithic version of feminism that the festival and other in um, intentionally indifferent iterations of Korean feminism seek to claim. It's true and unfortunate that this schism exists, but it's precisely that tension between alternate, um, even competing feminisms that keeps feminism vital in this instance, each side having to articulate and hopefully think about what is or should be included under the rubric of feminism and why. So my questions for um, Dong Young are, um, to what extent does the stance of the festival organizers represent Korean mainstream feminism uh, with respect to queer sexualities? These are, again, real questions. I don't, these are not rhetorical questions. Um, okay, and my second question is, is there a concomitant uh, intentional indifference to feminism within Korean lesbian discourse? Um, I noticed that none of the Project L people you interviewed seem to claim the identity of feminism, um, at least not after their rejection from the festival, which is totally fair in that, in that context. Um, but it's just a question for me. Okay, uh, Elizabeth Linden's and Jennifer Kennedy's ambitious Dictionary of Temporary Approximations and the town hall discussion it was meant to enable seems to take the idea of intentional indifference and sort of turn it on its head. Um, an experiment that intentionally looks askance at those linguistic, linguistic and ideological log jams that so often halt progress in this area in hopes of dislodging them makes a lot of sense. But as they ask here, what kind of frame were they making? I want to applaud them for having the courage to even ask this question as it's the most important but often uh, the most difficult one to level at oneself. Their attempt to answer that question here tracks many of the dilemmas of contemporary feminism, perhaps nowhere better conceptualized as this, and I'm quoting from their paper, uh, with so much difference in individuality inherent in its expression, how does one create a united movement? Um, so my questions for Liz and Jen are, um, what do you make of this focused energy on developing the dictionary itself? Um, does it suggest that there is a felt need for new language? And if so, what are your thoughts about that? Um, my second question for them is, what are the pros and cons of the town hall format for this kind of work? And my third question for them is, uh, oh, I'm gonna skip the third question. It's more for me, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, and so finally, uh, I share Marissa Vignold's uh, resistance to the neologism uh, post-feminism for all the same reasons she does. To designate something post is to posit its demise, resolu uh, resolution, obsolescence, et cetera. And it seems to me, um, especially after reading all these papers, that it is alive and well, feminism is alive and well, and that there is an ongoing need for it in public discourse. But her call to recognize continuity is more than simply an invitation to see contemporary artists as direct inheritors of feminist art legacies. It's a charge placed on us all to, in her term, or I guess she's quoting someone else, 
activate the archive. If we agree that feminism is not dead, then perhaps it behooves us to not sit around mourning as if it were, I'm talking to myself here, um, or to celebrate it only in its present or future vitality, but to educate and remind ourselves of why it's not dead yet, or, um, and of that before that has produced what we've come to take for granted in the after. Uh, my questions for uh, Professor Vigneault are, um, so I agree with you about the problems of temporal sort of cordoning off of feminism that the post does, but I'm also curious about that impulse um, and what it's about um, and how it's related to the I'm not a feminist but sort of uh, response. If feminism has become for some people such an abject identification, then is there something possibly productive about finding a linguistic marker? I guess this sort of goes back to the dictionary question about finding a linguistic marker that denotes, if not a break, then a change from the stereotyped, unappetizing contemporary construction of an earlier feminism. Uh, and my second question is, um, is there something different or new about these contemporary artists' engagement with the term, uh, with the term and political category of feminism? Uh, while I totally appreciate and agree with Marissa's suggestion that we view Amer's work in relation to, say, Miriam Shapiro's or, Karen, um, or even Karen Finley or somebody like that, um, the world has gone through some quite dramatic changes since that earlier moment in feminist art. Uh, war, globalization, war and globalization have become organizing principles at the ground level in a way that I think um, was different, not that those concepts didn't exist in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, but I think it's, I would argue that it's a little different now. Um, so rather than seeing these developments as parallel to a trajectory that is globalization as a parallel to a trajectory of feminism, what happens if we think of them both within the same frame, literally, as I think somebody like Amir is trying to do? Um, so lastly, um, Elizabeth and Jennifer asked in their town hall discussion, what does feminis feminism look like today? And seem to have concluded that instead of an answer, they were left with more questions. But I want to suggest that, that, that perhaps that is an answer in and of itself. Perhaps feminism now, its politics, its aesthetic strategies, its very existence, is an open question in the very best sense of that phrase. In other words, if what we were to, if, if we were to consider feminism, not as a specifically demarcated political agenda, but as a mode of questioning hierarchies of power, and how, and of how we and others are, I, I missed a word in here, and of how we and others are, what would happen if we were to consider feminism, not as a specifically demarcated political agenda, but as a mode of questioning hierarchies of power, and of how we and others are implicated in such structures. Um, I admit I chuckled when I read of the impulse to meta question that Liz and Jennifer spoke of as it struck me as queerly appropriate for a feminist gathering. Um, and I say that with love and some self-chiding, but also deep respect for the contribution to the project of structural critique that feminism has brought, a, um, has brought us, is bringing us, will, I hope, continue to bring us. Questions in and of themselves don't change anything, of course, but they do invite an answer, or at least a conversation, and thereby create a relation. It's a form of openness that does not necessarily presume passiveness. A question asks for something, information, action, reparation, perhaps assistance, but it may also, and often it simultaneously does, offer those very same things. So with that, I will leave it to the panel and to you. Okay, thanks. Um, so I guess I'll first open it up briefly to the panel to see if they re respond to any of that or if they have questions for each other, and then we'll turn it over to the floor. Okay? So. Okay. Um, well, to start, I, I first want to make a little disclaimer um, about Tira Venetia's work, which I actually think is much more complex than it's reduced to in Boyau's theory. Mm -hmm. And so I think what I was critiquing was actually more of the way the theoretical construct of relational aesthetics takes politics yeah. out. Um, but that I don't actually believe that most of the work does. Mm. So that's one of the things. Mm -hmm. that it's about c why, is a why is a theory of art more preferred that um, 
takes politics out or the possibility of political change off the table yeah. um, and actually prefers the idea of a loosey-goosey aesthetics of politics. Mm -hmm. So um, so for me, that was a really important thing. Um, and in terms of the, uh, the possibility of actual community across those tables, I think it's, r it's really hard to say, and I think that one of the things that I think is most important sort of across this frame of new feminism, if we, maybe, maybe we'll use new feminism instead of post-feminism, <laughs> um, is the idea of um, inadequate solutions, and that's something like from Gayatri Spivak. So inadequate solutions, saying that I, I know I can't fix this completely, I can't, I'm not gonna change world distribution or make everybody get along, but if you can create um, specific, small, local moments and gestures, um, and something comes out of that and there's a little spark, that that's very feminist. Thanks for the beautiful questions. And um, probably I agree about some of the comments that you made about the probably the shift, I mean, in, in general sense, the shifting definition of what is being feminist and, and, and also as a, as a both politics as well as a stance. Um, also your suggestion and as well as insinuation of uh, how to look at this relationship between the feminism as well as, as, well as a lesbian activism or lesbian feminism. This is really complicated if you just look at the theoretic, from the theoretical perspective, it's really complicated relationship. But also, uh, instead of focusing on the conflicts, we can actually think about more positive contribution that the lesbian feminists can do it to, for uh, either from the activist standpoint of view as well as a theoretical standpoint point of view. But specifically related to the questions, uh, I'm not so sure. I mean, it's, it, it, first of all, you have to define what's the general you know, feminist stance in the feminist organizations in Korea. It's, it's almost difficult, impossible to define, and, and as well situate uh, the, the relationship between lesbian feminism and feminist organization in Korea in general. I just wanted to highlight some moments. Uh, of course, there's uh, some problem for me to uh, work with the one example and try to find some theory and because I have to work within this uh, framework so I keep on saying I'm doing, I'm doing too much and too little <laughs> but, um, but there's a, some kind of com common uh, problem with that that's all I can imply so I can't really properly answer the questions but I agree with you or some of the comments but at the same time I want to highlight that why I'm doing this despite all great theories and how this whole gender theories and career theories open up the questions about it about identity politics. We still ignore this group of women. I mean, I started to write about because uh, I was very moved with accidental, you know, encounters with them. I mean, they're not clear about the theories. They actually criticize feminism, but at the same time, they, along with the feminism, they're not really quite sure about their political positions. But what really moves me most is that there are we don't have enough space for them to discuss about it. I mean, it's still really their voice is really on the back of the, somewhere. I mean, they're all very active feminists, but they can't really bring up that issues of lesbian to the foreground. I mean, we always oftentimes, it's good to open our discussion within the feminist discourses, but I always see they're kind of almost emotional, mm -hmm. a yearning to be included and, and to be discussed. So I, uh, uh, after writing a dissertation about this, something that's totally influenced by career theory, I just feel like, you know, in terms of identity politics, I have to do something about activism, something that I, something really coming out of uh, my personal encounters with them. Uh, you know, that's a quite interesting experience for me, so I wanted to do something about it. Thank you for your comments. Um, I briefly wanted to note, though, when Liz and I, um, both of us came across individually and um, sometimes at the same time in the same experience, the charge that feminism is over, that wasn't necessarily put forth by a specific generation, an older generation, but various generations. <laughs> I just wanted, I wanted to make that note because um, it's important to me at the event and at, in future projects that we are trying to work, although our interest is in thinking about feminism in a way that isn't so tightly tethered to past moments, 
um, we're interested in a model of peership that is transgenerational, um, that thinks about com community through shared experience, um, and so on, mm -hmm. uh, which is really important to the project, and I think to, you know, establishing what feminism is. So I just wanted to make that note. Um, well, so you also asked about if there was a felt need for a new language, and I think, um, well, I can't say definitively yes or no, but there were definitely some voices, some participants for whom um, the new language was, was really appealing. I mean, a new language. And I think it's sort of telling Jen and I, prior to doing the uh, sort of larger public event at the Whitney, we did a small sort of trial run with some of our friends and colleagues at the ISP. And um, it was definitely telling that afterwards, a number of people came up to me and said, yes, lived practice, I'm gonna use it, you know? And we thought, oh God, no, like what have we done? This is really, really not what our intention was. Um, and yet there is something quite sort of liberating to be able to invent things that feel organic to you. The question is, how do you share them then? Um, and in terms of the town hall model, we were just, it, it appealed to us because it was a sort of non-hierarchical way to initiate a discussion with a group of strangers, basically. It sort of acknowledged that there was some unified field, i.e. that you were all from that town, um, but there was no sort of singular uh, voice. I'll make just yeah, a, a one last quick comment. <laughs> I'll go through and thank you again. Um, but just a comment on the word post. Uh, this is nothing new in the history of arts. I mean, certainly it's come around with post-impressionism, post-modernism, uh, post-avant-garde. It gets added on and it has been added on by art historians and critics over the, the years. And so I think that that does show that there is this impulse to categorize, to come up with these ontological divisions. And there is, I, I see one positive side in that, in that it gives us a grounding to stand from, and it gives us something that we can work off of. But as long as we recognize that there can then be open boundaries around them that we can activate, we can have activism, we can move between those, then I think that's what's the most important thing here. And um, I, I see that as we shift, as we change with our generations of artists that are practicing now, there is continuity, and I like that reference back to what has come before, but at the same time we are under these shifting grounds and different boundaries and global movements, and that can open up um, from a technological standpoint, from everybody on the internet across the, the globe, to one in communities, to one across different countries, and so Amer's work, which I gave a very uh, cursory exploration of today and which is so nuanced and has deserved all of the scholarship and more that will come on her her practice um, is one that brings in so many more issues I mean for example the veiling she has that that background that, that uh, uh, Islamic background so that has come there too yes yeah, so activate move <laughs> produce <laughs> yes that's the bottom line okay. Okay. we probably have Hi, um, I'm Elizabeth Sackler, and I want to thank all of you because I think they were just a wonderful group of papers, and I think you should get a great big round of applause. And to tell each of you and the panelists this afternoon that this is precisely why the Center for Feminist Art exists, so that we can have a place to uh, discuss, to engage, and to probe into the future and our futures. And Karen, thank you for your remarks, because I happen to agree with you that I think the answer is uh, in the questions about what it is, and not knowing, and I don't know that we will ever uh, come to that moment, short of a revolution and living in a matriarchy. <laughs> um, when I was discussing the Center for Feminist Art uh, six years ago with the museum, and for one moment the question came up um, by the director and deputy director about the use of the word feminist art instead of women's art. And uh, we had a discussion, a brief discussion, and I said, you know, we're not going to solve 
uh, what it means and what it is here. In fact, the whole point of having a center is to make a place available because I see feminism and feminist art uh, as a work in progress. And it is what it is in the moment. And hopefully it will continue to embrace people and ideas and change the way in which we function as a culture and that women will have parity and more wall space. So I apologize that I don't have a question for you, but I want to say thank you very no, much. Thank you. And it's like a <laughs> little dream. For me, it's a dream come true to hear you. So thank you. Um, I'm Linda Stein, um, and I've enjoyed this panel very much. And following up on what Marissa said, um, would you agree, all of you, that we should acknowledge that the use of the word post is kind of an elitist term to the extent that it's embraced by intellectual, academic, uh, media communities, and that there's this vast terrain of people who are still struggling, we must say, with the issues of feminism and homophobia or queer theory and racism. And we're talking about it, well, should we use post or not post, but we're talking in a small community and um, we should acknowledge the other. It's a question, though. Do you agree? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, absolutely. And thank you. Gesundheit. Um, <laughs> I, I think this was, is what gets to the heart of my project, is that it's language. And what is language used for? And language, in many respects, is used to uphold certain social conventions. And so if the use of post-feminism is taken on by who we might see as those in the upper classes, intellectual elites, um, those who have access to mass media and can proclaim their voices in spaces where others cannot, then what is their agenda in doing so? Their agenda, as I see it, is to uphold their particular positions in society. Because once you put the word post-feminism out there, post-racial out there, you're saying that we don't need to have to deal with all these other people down there anymore because we're up here on our kind of high horse uh, standards. So for me, it does erase those voices down there. And it is completely a class issue and a gender issue in so many respects, and they are completely intertwined in all of those. So it's a real political activism to take on and to not even deny, but to reject this word post-feminism, because what post-feminism does is to deny the history and the voices of everyone who has come before and who, of everyone who is currently living. So by rejecting and saying that we don't want that term at all. It's not that there's just going to be a denial, it's going to be a refusal of it. Then that is complete political activism for me. And I hope that that's what does then open up those voices and continue that dialogue and allow people those spaces. So, yes. Yeah, if I may add to that, I think one of the problems with both post feminism and the question of whether we replace the word feminism um, is that the power of language, it, it gives the implication that the issues taken up by feminism are finished and they're completely not. And I think that that's a real danger that has happened in that we've achieved, you know, 20% of what the goal of the 60s set out and that's like just enough for people to not be really, really angry. And so they can sort of hold back. And I think the power of language that we have to sort of remember is that it's discursive. And so if feminism, you know, if the, the phrase, I'm not a feminist, but, is you know is giving up that power to redefine it to say that you know the powers that be the patriarchal powers that want to put those put forth post feminism have also made feminism something that women who mm -hmm. would benefit from feminism reject yeah. and so if we as feminists can both claim feminism and redefine it in a way that's completely claimable mm -hmm. that that's a very powerful act too because once i ask my students well what do you think feminism means then they say, oh, oh, yeah. I wasn't well, thinking I, I along can do that. that. I'm, so, just, I'm not that. Oh, kind of okay, I, maybe I am <laughs> that, and that's what I am interested in. So it's discussions, talking, getting out there. 
try again this impulse towards categorization. What are we? Are we next generation? Are we something? Um, I, I find myself situated. I'm you know, 31. I studied in my 20s with Norma oh, Browdy and Mary ahead. Garrett, who are in their. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't <laughs> share ages, okay, but um, it's towards the end of their academic auditory. careers, but are still prolific writers as well. So I was so engrossed with them as people, as writers, as theorists, oh, that I don't feel like there was any separation between us as just being together in that way. Um, but I do recognize that there are a lot of new issues that have come to play in my evolution from the mid-90s to today as well that are very different than some of the issues that they were facing in the 1960s and 70s as well. Um, so, and then there's also that, that divide that has come up between second wave feminist, Essentialism versus constructionism, and third wave, is it getting into theory? Well, I myself practice theory, I practice art, I practice uh, a number of different things, and so I've always seen this sort of combination between all of them. So I'm very intergenerational. That's what I, I like to push for, but I'm certain that other people have opinions. <laughs> well, I just wanted to jump in. Something that Jen was speaking about earlier um, is really Mary Kelly's mm -hmm. um, concept of generations, which is that um, generations are built, you know, not on parity in age, but parity in experience. And so um, the generational grouping looks different in her concept than I think it does in the traditional one. And that sort of um, messes with the wave concept as well. I'm not quite sure that I, I'm not quite sure that I think waves are necessarily unuseful but I don't really like the word. It makes it sound like surfing. <laughs> but, but also, uh, I, I'm happy that the, somebody mentions about the second and third waves, um, because uh, uh, when the initial response about the post-feminist coming out, it's not just the prestigious or prestige of patriarchal, whatever, power. Uh, it's also the politics within the discourse of feminism, particularly the different groups of women. I, I don't really think it's just male or female problem. It's just uh, that you, you, can, you have to consider the, the different ranks or different political desire within the feminist discourses. In fact, especially you mentioned about Mary Kelly and she, I mean, from a certain perspective, she become established feminist artist. So we have a different kind of canons within the feminist art. So we, this struggle is not just between the gender, it's really within, we have to also consider really within the feminist discourses and feminist canons of art history and criticism, important feminist theorist as opposed to probably unheard voices. And just a last point, I think a problematic with that is that it's temporal and not localized. And so I think we have to recognize that like first generation and second generation, as somebody brought up in the earlier part, have a sort of Western notion. And so we're definitely past that in the sense that people are um, dealing with different kinds of feminism in different places. And, and I think that the wave concept probably would be difficult to handle with that. <laughs>